Grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. As I was telling the kids, sometimes love requires us to have to do yucky things. And that was true this last week as I helped to conduct the funeral of 19-year-old Caitlin Carmen, the sophomore from USD studying to be a special ed teacher who was killed in a car accident uh, in which she was not at fault. And everyone who knew Caitlin is still wrestling with the question, why? 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 And those of us who've lived long enough know that there's never really answers to that question of why. And if you keep on asking it, eventually it leads you to the biggest why question of all, which is why did a loving God in the first place create a world where such accidents and tragedies that devastate us could happen? And actually... To that question, the Bible does give us an answer. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, there are three little words that answer that big, big question. God is love. Now, for, for those of you who, for whom that makes absolutely no sense, let me remind you that true love is messy. In fact, I don't think there is any way to make a world where true love is possible and not have it be messy. Let me try to show you what I mean. Last weekend, a a new movie was released from Disney, A Wrinkle in Time, adaptation of a 1963 book that I remember reading as a kid. And one scene from the book that did make it into the movie is when uh, three kids, Meg, Charles Wallace, and their friend Calvin, arrive at last on this planet that is under the control of an evil entity that is holding uh, uh, Meg and Charles Wallace's father captive. And as they come and walk into the the city of this this alien world, uh, they are struck, actually, by how peaceful and serene and everything looks. They walk into a cul-de-sac where the houses are are well-maintained and lawns are cut and... uh, And their first indication that maybe something is amiss in this world is that all of a sudden they watch and every door to every house opens at the same time and kids come out all holding a red ball and they begin to play with that ball, bouncing it on their driveways in unison. You see, the evil that controlled that world had indeed taken away all the messiness, the messiness that comes from people by controlling what each person did. So as a result, there was no crime. There were uh, no accidents that took the lives of teenagers. But also, there was no love on that world. For love, by definition, always allows the one who is loved the power to be able to say no No to that love. In fact, the only world where true love is a possibility is a world where we have the power to say no to the God who created us, to say no to the God who loves us, even if it means saying yes to things that hurt us and hurt those around us. Love is messy. I think that also explains why Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son the way he did. You know that parable where the younger son demands his share of the inheritance way before his father ever dies because he intends to leave home, leave family, and never look back. He basically was saying no to his father's love. And incomprehensibly, the dad in that parable, which is something it's hard for us to understand, honors his request, complies, and gives him that share of the inheritance. And I think it's because the father understands for love to be love, he has to allow his son to say no 
even to his own love. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly the way to parent in every situation, okay? For one thing, when young children are involved, it, it's, it's actually the best thing parents can do is to intervene when their child is about to make a bad decision and save them from disastrous consequences. But the younger son in this parable is no longer a child. And, of course, the way Jesus tells the story, the story doesn't end with this son's isolation and abandonment and separation. But rather, it's a story about the father. The father who stays waiting. The father whose life is a testimony that he never stopped loving his wayward son. And in fact, enfolded his son back into his life, back into his arms, when the son finally returned home. You know, love is messy. I've seen that parable played out a dozen times in real life, especially with families that have struggled with a family member who's in the throes of an addiction. And at first, the family will try to uh, control uh, the actions of, of their loved one uh, to, uh, to keep them from their addiction. And then uh, when that doesn't work, they will at least try to help provide for the needs that this person needs that they're not taking care of themselves. And that doesn't work. And eventually, they learn that they have to let go of their son or daughter, much like the father in that parable. And they know that it's letting go with no guarantee that their loved one will return. But love is messy like that. And I bring all this up because we have to understand the nature of love and how messy love is if we're going to understand the gospel this morning when the disciples tell Jesus that there were some Greeks who wanted to meet him Jesus says rather cryptically the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified and then a few uh, sentences later he prays father glorify your name now maybe you're sitting there thinking what does glory and love have to do uh, with all of this because we think we know something about glory, after all. It, it is the NCAA uh, championship tournaments. It is uh, it's high school basketball cha- uh, tournaments going on. And we have seen, the, 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 it, it played out many times before, how it's the final game of the tournament and the clock runs out and one team emerges as the champions and the fans run out onto the court and they congratulate and they honor the, the players and they celebrate. I mean, that is a scene of glory. We get that. And it's been a while, for another example, it's been a while since we've ever seen a monarch's coronation But again, that is a ceremony filled with lots of pomp and ritual, and there are things like a scepter and uh, and, uh, an orb, and of course the crown. And these are all things that that are done to, to show that this person has been elevated in their position. They have been glorified, and we get that. What we don't get is Jesus' sense of glory and being glorified. That's what's strange. Because what you need to know about John's gospel is that every time Jesus talks about being glorified, he's referring to one thing. He's referring to being stripped and beaten and nailed to a cross and raised up to die. Now that's not my idea of glory. But it is for God. And that's because you have to remember those three words from 1 John. God is love. And God is glorified every time that love wins. And certainly on Good Friday when the Son of God accepted the very worst within us, our our pride, our hate, our fear, all those things that nailed him to the cross, and still chose to do so for our sake. That was a day that love won. And that's God's idea of glory. And so in the parable, love won when the father welcomed home back into his heart the son who had told him, I hate you. 
Love wins for us. Really, every time we come up and share in this meal of Holy Communion, acknowledging not only our own brokenness, but acknowledging that it's the body and blood of God's Son that claims us and saves us. Because love wins when we realize that God knows everything about us that's a mess. All those ways that we have said no to God's love in our lives. And God still, through this sacrament, shows that he chooses to love us. Because when it comes to us, love wins. That's God's idea of glory. Now, I mentioned at the start by saying that no one will be able to explain why a 19-year-old girl should be killed in an auto accident. And I have no reason why it had to be Caitlin. But I can say why it happened. I can say why the driver that caused the accident did so. Because that driver, who, who is like all of us from time to time, was not choosing at that moment, on that day, to love his neighbor and drive accordingly in a way that protects and keeps the neighbor in mind. That's because we are all slow to love God. We are all slow when it comes to learning the precious people whom God creates around us. It's part of our human condition. And our refusal to love never ceases to create painful messes in and around our lives. But remember, that's not how the story ends. God's love wins each and every time God embraces us in the middle of our mess, when God gets himself dirty by walking with us through our mess. Certainly God's love for Caitlin won the day she was baptized, and on the day that he swept her up into her arms. But no, just as surely God wins. Because for the driver who hit Caitlin, because that person also is within God's purview of love. And because that's the way the story is going to end. Love wins. That's the end of the story. And all those precious lives that have been lost to us along the way will be restored. And we will be people who have at last learned how to love. Have learned how to walk with each other in their mess. And we will give thanks to God for that gift. Yeah, God's love is messy. But God wouldn't have it any other way. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all our understanding keep our hearts and our minds focused on Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.